Welcome to the Middle East File. I'm Jeremy Barker, Director of the Middle East Action Team at the Religious Freedom Institute. The Middle East File podcast features conversations with authors about publications on a range of issues impacting religious freedom in the Middle East, including governance and security, humanitarian assistance, geopolitics and foreign policy, human rights, and much more. To find more of these conversations and to learn more about the work of the Religious Freedom Institute, visit rfi.org. Welcome to this edition of the Middle East File. Our guest today is Dr. Dennis Petrie, the International Director of the International Institute for Religious Freedom. He's also the founder and scholar at large of the Observatory of Religious Freedom in Latin America, as well as the Executive Director of the Foundation Platform for Social Transformation, a lecturer at the Hague University of Applied Sciences in the Netherlands, a professor at the Latin American University of Science and Technology in Costa Rica, as well as a consultant and advisor to a number of organizations and institutions working on religious freedom around the world. Dennis joins us to talk about his recent article, The Tyranny of Religious Freedom Rankings, that was published in March 2020 in the Review of Faith and International Affairs. Look forward to your thoughts on today's conversation. And welcome to this edition of the Middle East File, and very glad to have be, have joining us today, uh, Dr. Dennis Petrie, the International De- Director of the International Institute for Religious Freedom. Dennis, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thank you very much, Jeremy, for, uh, for inviting me. And really glad to have you on to, to talk about what I think is really um, an interesting article that came out in March in the Review of Faith and International Affairs on the tyranny of religious freedom rankings, uh, which for for those who are working on on religious freedom is, I think, a conversation worth having. Um, As I often uh, mentioned to to interns or others that we have working with us, it seems as if every speech that, that talks about this opens with some reference to either the Pew forums, restrictions on religions research or if you're maybe talking about Christians in particular, the Open Doors World Watch List. Um, and your article does a, a great job of, of looking at kind of what those rankings tell us and, and some of the things that they don't tell us. So thank you so much for, for this essay. Yes, no, thank you very much for your, your interest. Um, and it's, it's indeed a, an ongoing conversation in, uh, in academia about what the best way is to uh, measure um, religious freedom uh, violations um, and uh, um, and well I think maybe I should say from the start um, I'm I'm not at all opposed to uh, religious freedom data sets um, actually I've been very much involved in a number of them um, so I've, I've worked for a long time um, um, for the uh, research department of Open Doors International um, I was the associate director of the uh, World Watch mm-hmm. um, list uh, department um, and um, um, together with um, the International Institute for Religious Freedom, where I'm now the director, um, we uh, worked uh, in 2012 um, on the methodological overhaul um, of the World Watch list um, to, to make it you know, uh, uh, in tune with, with academic standards. I've also worked uh, for, for a short while as a visiting scholar at the Religion and State Project with Professor Jonathan Fox mm-hmm. um, at bar University in, in Israel. Um, so I'm very familiar with those two uh, data sets, and I'm a fan of both, um, actually, and I think they are um, uh, make a very uh, important contribution, um, and they've had a major influence on, on policy as well. Um, but I'm uh, I'm concerned that uh, about two things really. Well, first that the uh, limitations of these data sets are are not well uh, known, um, and I'm also concerned about the use that is made by uh, policymakers. Um, of these of these data sets um, so that's really what uh, what I'm uh, I'm looking at in my article yeah, yeah and that's great and that gives a, a bit of the backstory and that was the first question to open with is yeah what's kind of the story behind behind the story what came to um, bringing you to write this piece at this time um, obviously the experience from working with those data sets is one part piece of it but yeah what's what's the story behind this article so um 
I've uh, recently completed my PhD dissertation. Um, um, it's called The Specific Vulnerability of Religious Minorities. Um, so I, well, I completed it in 2020, but it was a project that took me uh, almost eight years um, because I was also working at, at the same time. Um, and in uh, my research, I um, looked at religious freedom violations in Latin America. And basically my dissertation is an answer to uh, all all those people that um, automatically seem to assume that there are no religious freedom issues in uh, Latin America. Um, and um, of course, this this uh, uh, program is on, on the Middle East, um, and it seems <laughs> um, more obvious uh, to many uh, that there are religious freedom issues in in the Middle East, but there also are in in uh, Latin America. And um, what I what I really um, discovered is that the uh, data that's out there um, leaves many aspects undetected, um, and and uh, and that is actually also true for for many religious freedom violations in the Middle East. Um, and so so there's so much that um, all those data sets for, for, for both methodological and conceptual reasons do not grasp. Um, and, um, and, and if you uh, then uh, um, look at the use of these data sets by policymakers, um, it, 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 it gets even more simplified, um, the information that, uh, uh, that, that is presented. So, so that's, that's kind of the, the background of, 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 of what led me to, to, uh, to really look into religious freedom data sets and and, and try to evaluate, to assess their, or to audit even, um, the, their, their, their methodologies. Yeah, oh, that, and that makes a lot of sense. And that is a, yeah, a really significant thing that, that I know we've seen in our work as well of um, you need data, um, but it needs to be the right data and we need to know what it tells us and, and the things that it, it doesn't tell us. Um, and so as, as you kind of argue in the piece, what would you, what would you say is kind of the main thesis that you're putting forward in, in this article? So in the article, I, I, I basically discuss um, three things. Um, the first um, is that uh, religious freedom uh, data sets are uh, very useful um, um, in, 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 in itself. Um, they leave a number of aspects uh, undetected, but they, they still give a uh, uh, quite a good picture of the religious freedom situation in in the world from a comparative perspective. But the problem, in my view, is with the rankings. Um, rankings uh, are really misleading um, because they, um, as I write in the article, they give the false impression that they are precise um, when really there's uh, not only a lot of uncertainty, but also they highlight differences between uh, countries that are um, that, that, that may be very, very similar. So um, I, I think um, a, a better use of those data sets is to uh, really focus on um, the data itself, the variables, how they are scored, um, and the uh, underlying uh, research, maybe the accompanying narratives. Those are much more meaningful than, uh, than rank, rankings. Of course, I know that rankings are very appealing um, to journalists, to policymakers, even to academics. Um, but um, as I say, they, they are misleading. So that's the, 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 the first um, issue that I uh, um, take on in, in my article. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. And, and this certainly isn't an issue exclusively with religious freedom rankings. As you point out, there's other sorts of international indexes, whether that's the, whether it's Freedom House or um, International Peace Index or, or other things that, that suffer some of the same um, challenge of appearing more precise than perhaps they, they are. Is there a particular case that, that maybe stood out to you from your research that helps to, to illustrate that, whether from your PhD work in Latin America or, or elsewhere? Yes, so, um, well, I guess, uh, generally speaking, what is really the difference um, between uh, uh, a country ranking first or, or 22nd or, or, or 23rd hey, on, 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 on the list like that? Um, it, it, when, when those countries are, are, are really quite, quite close. Um, and, uh, well, there, 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 there are issues, for example, now, um, there's this, this conflict ongoing in, in Ukraine. Um, uh, right now, um, and um, uh, 
well, we know that there are religious freedom issues um, in 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 parts of Ukraine, um, and you know, it, it it really makes a difference how how those are are scored, right? Um, and um, and that actually uh, relates to the the second point I make in in in, in my uh, in my article, which is um, the subnational dimension of religious freedom. Um, religious freedom rankings are. Um, macro level aggregates um and and so um although um you know a national score should be the sum of um individual or, or local localized scores um there's actually many uh nuances of local situations that that uh um those data sets don't uh don't grasp and and rankings because they're aggregates, because they're averages, really, um, also don't 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 detect. Um, and and so um, on some uh, uh, data sets, the um, um, some territory, the, the disputed territories right now, right, between Russia and, and Ukraine in, in in the east of, of Ukraine, um, are are categorized um, under Russia, and others are categorized under under Ukraine, and other uh, um, data sets uh, character um, or record them under Ukraine. And that really makes a difference for the for the national score, but also for policy interventions. Because um, imagine um, that uh, um, international development organizations make funds available um, to promote religious freedom in, in Ukraine. Well, you know, there, there is uh, a possibility that those funds will be executed uh, through projects in, in the west of Ukraine. But that would make no sense because you know the problems uh, really uh, occurred in 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 the east, but it's more difficult to work there. And maybe we, you know, if they're uh, considered under Russia, then um, then then they're not even noticed. So um, there, there's all kinds of policy implications as well um, um, that that tie in with the uh, um, subnational dimension of, of religious freedom, which is the the second dimension, I the second issue I, I I highlight in my article. Yeah, which is is a really important point and. Um, just to say on that, the policy implications of this, this is something um, that actually a, a colleague of ours at the Religious Freedom Institute in previous work working in Congress um, helped to draft legislation that just passed the House of Representatives in the U.S. Uh, last week on the Ukraine Religious Freedom Act. And it was looking at exactly the scenario that you described of the, the religious freedom conditions in areas under Russian influence were kind of in this gray zone of they were because they were outside the recognized national borders of Russia. They the uh, policy mechanisms weren't necessarily taking those into account and in looking at holding Russia to account. Um, but nor were they necessarily the um, the role of, of Ukraine. And so looking at a policy um, mechanism to to hold states to account for areas under their control or influence. Um, in religious freedom, looking at whether, whether it's punitive measures of, of sanctions or, or other things or programmatic policy um, efforts to address religious freedom concerns. And certainly Ukraine and Russia is one example. We can think of, of areas here in the Middle East where have similar um, similar similar scenarios at play as well. So that's that subnational dimension is certainly of relevance for, for policymakers and, and policy uh, responses. Yes, exactly. No, no, totally. Um, and and I'm, I'm, I'm glad the, the Religious Freedom Institute is, is working on that uh, right now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's also for, for understanding, not just on policymakers, but even programmatically, as you somewhat alluded to, um, the, the level of, of detail on a subnational level. It could go, in some ways, kind of both ways of a particular problem area could color the assessment of an, an entire country. And so you have, I mean, the, the, for Pew, an example where they look at the, the aggregate scores of number of people displaced or other things, and that could be just one small pocket that colors the ranking of an entire country. On the other hand, an overall positive approach assessment of a country may mask severe violations that are happening in a, in a particular area as well. And so that, yeah, that lack of granularity um, could could mask um, information both ways. Yes, no, absolutely. Um, um, 
uh, yeah, the, the, both scenarios are are are, are true, um, and and I think we can uh, come up with many many illustrations of, of that. But I, I think um, the main problem is, of course, the availability of, of data. Data collection is is is, is really very very challenging. Um, in and and if I mean, it's also time consuming um, and and very very uh, resource intensive. Now, if you want to really gather data for all um, subnational areas in the whole world, that 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 is you know almost you know impossible that there's no budget that, that can pay for that um so so i realize that is a tension um um but but i think um radio freedom data sets would uh, would do well to um try to broaden their sources a little bit more um um uh, so the um, the Pew uh, rankings, for example, the Pew indexes, um, are restricted to uh, 19 uh, sources, um, the set list of sources that that, that, that are consulted and encoded, um, and um, um, and there's just a lot of information that that's that's missed in those sources. So so broadening the sources even a little bit would uh, already go a long way um, to, to, to solve solve part of these these issues. Um, in addition, there's also uh, um, uh, some conceptual um, issues that that, that 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 could be could be addressed, um, and that actually relates to the third point in, in my article, which is the the emphasis that I make on the uh, multi-dimensionality of religious freedom. Religious freedom is really a, a, a topic uh, or a, an area that um, you know, touches upon many different uh, d- dimensions. Um, and basically, my starting point is that there is religious expression in in all spheres of of life um and therefore religious freedom also must be protected in all spheres of life um and and what you see is that most scholarship traditionally um, has focused on religious freedom um basically uh um as restricted as narrowed it down to freedom of worship um or to church state relations um but there's so much more um and and especially the role of non-state actors is 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 really really huge um also and what i've 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 uncovered in 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 my research on on latin america but it's it's definitely also true for for other regions including um especially the middle east um and and um, religious freedom data sets are actually coming uh um um, are only starting to 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 uh, to look at social hostilities, but it's still uh, a, 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 a very very uh, broad um, concept that um, I feel very strongly should be unpacked much more. Um, and th- th- it's um, human rights lawyers always say that uh, the state is responsible for any human rights violations, directly or indirectly. Um, um, directly, if they're responsible, if they if they if they are the direct perpetrators or indirectly if they uh, fail in their duty to protect um, but um, that may be true from you know an international law perspective um, but it's still very important to to understand how non-state actors and the wide range of non-state actors um, restrict religious freedom um, and not only freedom of worship but um, religious expression in all spheres of, of, of society all spheres of life yeah, and that's that's hugely relevant for um, for organizations that are seeking to be proactive and, and design programs and interventions to know yeah, where are the the sources of persecution coming from, um, yeah, whether that's state or communal, tribal, religious or otherwise. Um, so it's hugely relevant on that factor. Um, something that stood out to me as I read the article and even as you mentioned it just here is the that recognition of of religious expression or religious um, exercise in, in the American context, the free exercise of, of religion, yeah, speaks to how, how religion informs how people live in, in all aspects of life, which it adds a lot. And there's some, um, there's that kind of very narrow religious or freedom of worship um, kind of restriction, which is, is something, but, but certainly not everything. There's also been somewhat of an emphasis on religious identity as as one factor of it and kind of narrowing it similar to almost merging with merging with ethnic or or other types of of identities as you talk about that kind of multi-dimensionality or or the expression of religion where do you see the the particular contributions of looking at that um, the way that religion is expressed in addition to just the identity factors 
Yes, Jeremy, thank you for bringing that up. And that's actually a, a very important aspect um, that, that, that's also important. I think we should go back to, 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 um, to understand what religion is um, and what religion expre- re- religious expression really means. Um, and um, in my, in my um, dissertation, I actually develop a continuum um, of religious identity and behavior. Um, and basically what I say is that religion is not just an identity, um, like saying, well, I adhere to this creed or I'm, I'm, I'm a follower of, of this, this, this religion. Um, but religion also um, inspires uh, the behavior um, in society of its followers. And, um, and, and this is actually a, a, a very common uh, notion in, in religious sociology. Yeah? And there's this, this concept of lived religion that, that's frequently uh, mentioned. However, religious freedom uh, data sets in their methodologies, um, almost all of them tend to focus exclusively on religious identity. Um, and therefore, they only record, um, and that's part of the things that, that go undetected in religious freedom data sets, uh, they only record um, violations of religious freedom that are related to religious identity. Um, and, um, um, and, and maybe... Um, the least active forms of religious behavior, such as religious service attendance. Um, and so, so that's what they focus on. Um, but when you look at, um, at, at Latin America, for example, um, adhering to a particular religion um, or um, going to church, owning a Bible, that kind of thing, um, does not really get you into trouble. What gets you in trouble is, uh, you know, behavior um, in society um, that is uh, inspired by by religious convictions so uh, human rights activism um, work with youth um, work with drug rehabilitation uh, etc because that gets in the way of um, of, of, of the interests of, of, of other you know, di- of, of different non-state actors um, including organized crime which which I've, 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 I've looked at and drug traffickers um, and and those um, in a very real way, restrict religious expression and restrict those active forms of religious behavior, um, because they and I say they are forms of religious behavior because they are um, um, inspired by religious convictions, um, and those rarely show up in uh, in religious freedom data sets. Um, again, because they, their focus is on on religious identity, and so I just want to give you this this overview when you look at the. Um, uh, this continuum of, of religious identity and, and, and behavior. Um, and, and just to give you an illustration, to apply it to, 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 to a country like Mexico, um, religious identity, um, and let's focus on Christians, 90% of the population self-identifies as Christians. Okay? Um, but then if you look at um, what I call semi-active religious behavior, um, less than 50% um, regularly attends church. So we go down from 90 to 50 percent, and if you look at active behavior, active religious behavior, um, so um, intervention, social work, um, advocacy, uh, um, and even also missionary activity, then it goes down to 10 percent, right? Um, that actively um, live out their faith, and that turns out to be a minority, uh, of course, right? Um, because it's only 10 percent, right. but it's also the minority that suffers um, most human rights violations. And again, this doesn't get picked up by, by religious freedom data sets because they focus on identity and there's no variation you know, among the 90%. Um, it's, it's very difficult to detect any variation. And so that's why you need to zoom in to the behavioral dimensions of, uh, of, of religious freedom. Yeah, and at times the, in an attempt even to, to parse identity on, on denominational lines, um, doesn't necessarily get you, sometimes, in some cases it may get you there if you look at at a Catholic versus Protestant or, or something at times, it may get you a step closer, but no, I think as, as that illustration shows, um, it doesn't, it doesn't go very far to look at what really are, are the most substantial forms of, of religious freedom violations. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so it, uh, in the Middle East, for example, religious identity is often already uh, a source of persecution. Um, mm-hmm. But religious behavior even more so. Um, but in other parts of yeah. the world, religious identity is not a source of persecution. But that doesn't mean there's no persecution. Y- you need to look, zoom into the religious behavior and the consequences it has. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I imagine this may be a more substantial uh, part of your, your PhD work as well, but we'll ask it now and you can, you can pass if you want. Do you think, do you have any insights into perhaps why that um, emphasis on behavior is missed within religious freedom work or, or perhaps kind of human rights um, analysis more broadly? Well, I, I can really only only speculate um i think i think it is um first of all it's it's much easier to look at identity i mean there's there's uh, census questions that look at religious identity so it's it's relatively straightforward to to observe that um um to 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 uh to look at behavior it, it is is much more complicated because you really need mm-hmm. to do um you know uh, to have more sophisticated research designs and uh, um and 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 actually you know field work is really required in you know to be able to 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 gather you know information about about these things um so i i think that is the the that's probably the main reason why why, why it's not not considered um and there's also so that's that's really a, a data collection issue, and there's probably another issue as well, and that is more conceptual, um, and and that is to say, and and that's an argument that that you often hear as well, is that all those things that I've mentioned are not have nothing to do with religious freedom. They're really more issues that are related to um, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, um, freedom of association, um, and, 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 and therefore are not related to, to religion. But again, then we're going back to, uh, to narrowing the concept of religious freedom. And I, I believe very strongly that we should broaden it as, as, as much as possible. And there's a lot of intersectionality, actually. I mean, in the right to religious freedom, there's other human rights, like the ones I just mentioned, that that, that, that uh, conflate so um, so so I think it's it's a mistake um, and it, in any case this is a, a, a debate that 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 that, um, uh, that always starts about how to categorize the, such incidents um, but the end conclusion is well it's not a religious freedom issue therefore we don't need to deal with it um, and 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 my, my sense is well even if you don't want to see it as a religious freedom issue, it's still it's still a human rights violation that still needs to be addressed. Um, yeah. um, but 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 and but to be fair, it's very important to to recognize that all those things that happen are inspired by by religious convictions. Eh? Uh, that, that's that's I think the key the key the key the key difference here. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a really it's an interesting debate. Certainly one we we could talk about more because yeah, even I think there's perhaps critiques to be made toward religious freedom scholars for not seeing and understanding or foregrounding those implications more more clearly. I think there's also a critique to point toward kind of broader human rights concerns. And even if you are looking at as expression or assembly, um, when you look at the kind of in the main, whether it's um, Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch or others, the the amount of their kind of their sensitivity towards these rights violations that are based on, on religious conviction or religious behavior is often missing in, in the reporting. And so um, if you say it's not a religious freedom issue, it's a, a freedom of expression issue, well, it's often missing in, in that freedom of expression analysis as well. Um, so uh, implications of that, I think right now, it, it could be in both. And the, and the reality is it's far too often in neither. It's it's probably um, also a religious literacy issue and a religious freedom literacy issue, um, as 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 parts of the world are secularizing. Um, there, there, there may be less sensitivity towards um, religious issues um, and 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 the and what's important to to religious people. Um, it may not necessarily be recognized, and you even hear um, uh, people from the human rights world um, saying, "Why do we?" even need the right to religious freedom. We've got all those other rights that are protected that also protect religious freedom, like freedom of expression, freedom of association, etc. And why do we even need that? But then, uh, indeed, um, it will lead to to religious freedom and religious violations um, um, being even uh, becoming even less visible. And, and that would definitely be, be a mistake. But I, I, I wouldn't be too concerned about that um, either. Even though I've been criticizing religious freedom data sets, they have really... Uh, made an important contribution to 
put the issue of um, religious freedom on the uh, on the political agenda, especially in the United States, but also elsewhere, um, and and have contributed to make at least a large part uh, of of religious freedom violations in the world visible. Um, and so so that that's something I I I, I think. Uh, um, you know, makes makes me makes me optimistic. I don't think we should be too concerned about um, the right to religious freedom. Uh, um, you know, uh, being 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 getting getting forgotten um, anytime soon. Yeah. Well, as we kind of wrap up, and and your paper ends here as well. Looking at the the implications of of this, um, and to my mind, there's maybe three different audiences that they could speak to with this. Those that are in the uh, the researchers or practitioners, um, policymakers, and um, and then those that are are active in the field, uh, whether as advocates or, or programmatically or affected communities themselves, um, and the emphasis in, in those papers is maybe particularly on the researchers. But as you think about the the implications or takeaways from from this article, what would be some of the the main points you would want to highlight? Well. This, this is indeed um, uh, you know, to, to, to researchers. I, I would say uh, um, broaden your sources, right, um, for for data collection. Um, but that's actually also what I would say um, to to policymakers, to practitioners, um, uh, because um, it's 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 dangerous to rely on just one source. I mean, it's it's. It's it's very appealing to use one ranking, one number um, to to base everything off. But uh, um, really, it also doesn't do justice to the people um, that that work for um, that 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 develop those religious freedom data sets. All the work that they do cannot be uh, summarized by by a single number. Um, there, there, there's so much more behind that. Um, and and so um, so I guess I guess that that's important. We should stop. Um, relying on on rankings definitely rankings really don't say much um and 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 really try to zoom in to uh, specific dimensions uh, um be open to to nuances to to complexities um it's 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 definitely not uh not 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 not, not black and white it's 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 really uh 50 shades of gray um to <laughs> to make that reference um and 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 that's that's also true for for religious freedom definitely mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that that then bears out implications um, for policymakers as they look to to speak out and and address an issue to understand you know, what's the, the level of granularity of, of religious freedom violations in a given country and and is it uh, who's affected by this? Um, not a, as the Mexico example you gave earlier um, alluded to that uh, that mere census identification um, doesn't necessarily tell us everything we need um, or the form of it. There, there may be um, in, in the Middle East, there, there may be thousands of mosques that you can go to or, um, or hundreds of churches. And yet those communities themselves may be facing very s- severe restrictions on, on the religious expression in, in how it felt um, it manifests itself in behaviors. Absolutely. Um, well, Dennis, thank you so much for, for joining for today's discussion. It's a, a fascinating piece of research that I think um, does, it points in policymakers, researchers, practitioners in a direction, um, yeah, as you say, to broaden our sources, to ensure that the, the data, information, the collection of information um, that's coming from communities is, um, is verified and is getting into the hands of those who are able to do something with it. So um, thank you so much and look forward to, to having you on, I'm sure, in the future for, for further discussions. Yes, no, thank you very much. It was my pleasure, uh, Jeremy. I very much enjoyed talking to you. And uh, yes, let's, let's do it again. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much.